Moweni, Dumelang, Sambonani, and welcome to the Avrik podcast, a podcast that aims to bring clarity to the concept of violence and its consequences in the lives of victims and survivor groups, as well as the perpetrators and their descendants. In this episode, Professor Anthony Collins talks about the representations of violence in his lecture titled, The Sound of Children Screaming Has Been Removed, Conundrums of Silence and Violence. It keeps being this point where I want to cry. As a, a scholar of violence and trauma, there's this, these moments where I don't know what to do, where, the, where everything is so chaotic and overwhelming that I, that I can't think. It's not even that I can't work analytic in the problem. I can't think at all. So I thought I'd talk about that today and to try and see if there's a way of making sense of it. So I, I study violence. I try and conceptualize violence. A lot of people research violence. I don't really research violence. I, I try to conceptualize it because I think that the fundamental mistakes we're making in the field of violence are around at the level of, of even understanding what we mean when we use the word violence at all. I think that the research, there's a lot of research, very productive, very interesting, very important, but it's before that. It's the moment before that of trying to say, what, 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 what kind of thing are we even imagining when we imagine violence? But when we study violence, we are also necessarily studying trauma. And it's not just that we're studying trauma, it's not just we have to bring in the, the field of trauma studies, the analytics of trauma, but, but the study of violence is also, in, in, a, in a real and immediate way, an experience of trauma. You cannot be a scholar in the field of violence without being a person who experiences trauma in the world. And that's really what I'm trying to see if I can make sense of. So in one sense, this talk is about representations of violence. This is a, this is a, a kind of theoretical conceptual talk. It's also one of my only pieces of work that isn't about South Africa. This is very unusual. I'm going to get, talk about a case that, is, that happens in the, the other violent place, the U.S. Partly just because it was so interesting, partly because even... Being in South Africa, where we're part of a globalized media universe, which is impinged on by these multiple accounts that happen all over the surface of the earth, but are somehow part of our, our, our kind of immediate imaginary. Um, but, and partly also just to get a bit of conceptual distance, because when we work on violence in South Africa, there's so much of our own history and immediacy in it that that can become overwhelming. And this example is, is, is a little bit abstract in a way that is perhaps helpful and perhaps not. So why I do this is because representations do work. That, that you know, often people, when they think we're talking conceptually about representation, like rep it's just about like, well, how is, it becomes a kind of a formal abstract account of how something is described. I'm interested in the work done by representations, that, that the way in which you talk about anything, the way in which you imagine anything, the way in which you speak or write about anything has immediate effects on people and their social relations, which means it has effects on the society and the future of the society and the direction of the transformations that are always happening in society. And I, I realized recently, it was actually only in the last few months, I've been, I've been asking myself this question, why do, I, why do I work on violence? It's just horrible. I mean, I've, I've spent my life specializing in horrible things and I, and I wanted to understand a bit better why I did that. And, and it seems to me that the major reason is that discourses of violence are possibly the biggest domain of misrepresentation. There's a lot of, there's a lot of areas which are highly prone to misrepresentation, like politics. But, but it seems that there's, there's something particularly going on in the space of, of, of accounts of violence where what is going on is being misrepresented. And one of the things that makes me happy is that the, the kind of emerging generation has really appropriated in the digital domain a, a conceptual account of this in the notion of gaslighting. I'm really, it really makes me very happy that people on the internet talk about gaslighting now in a way that they didn't five years ago, that they didn't when I was a student. 
because the notion of gaslighting gets at the heart of this of this question of misrepresentation. The idea of gaslighting is someone who's being abusive to you, misrepresenting the way they are abusing you. Someone who has power over you, representing that power as if you are the problem, they are not the problem. It's a process of mystification that not only mystifies abuse, it's abusive in itself. The very process of gaslighting is a form of abuse, okay? And it seems to me that generally the term gaslighting is talked about in relationships, like in intimate relationships, like this partner is gaslighting that partner. And I want to really blow that open and say that gaslighting should be taken as a fundamental conceptual term to talk about all relations of power and all exercises of inequality of power and thus of violence. And so that's part of, part of what I'm thinking about today. But I want to, to talk about this little story, okay? And it's uh, this, this happened last year at the Robb Elementary School in Texas in the U.S. Uh, on the 24th of May at about 11.30 in the morning. And just to advise you on the content, the, the, we, I'm going to be talking about um, extreme violence. Um, I'm not going to show you images of the violence itself, but uh, it's going to create conditions of you imagining a situation of very extreme violence. What happened at 11.30 uh, on the 24th of May is that a, a graduate of this, um, of this primary school walked into the school building and shot um, 36 um, fourth, uh, fourth um, grade students, killing 19 of them, and also killed uh, two of the teachers. Um, and I think it's important to actually, to pause for a moment um, and, and to actually consider Neve Bravo, Jacqueline Cesares, McKenna Elrod, Jose Flores Jr., Elia Garcia, Isaiah Garcia, Emery Gaza, Xavier Lopez, J.C. Levanas, Tess McMartha, Miranda Mathis, Alethea Ramirez, Annabel Rodriguez, Meta Rodriguez, Alexandria Ruba, Leila Lazarenbar, Jayla Segura, Elia Torres, Rogerio <coughs> Torres, Irma Garcia, and Eva Morales. Um, and one of the reasons I want us to consider each of those children and their two teachers is as a counter discourse in the representation of violence. Because whenever we represent violence, we represent the aggressor. We always know the names of the offenders. We always know the names of the criminals. We always know the names of the masterminds, the abusers. But what gets erased as part of the violence is not just the lives of these children, but the knowledge of them, their sense that they are, they are actually what this is about. Now, um, I want to show you this video. And that's the moment I don't know what to do with. Okay, this is a moment where I don't, I stop knowing how to think. I, I kind of wake up every morning and I study violent stuff and I read social media feeds. My social media feeds are tweaked to give me all the accounts of the worst violence that's going on in the world. And I then try and make conceptual sense of it. And what's interesting to me is the moment. Roland Barthes, in his theory of representation, he's talking about photography, he talks about the punctum, the moment, the bruising, the moment where the, where the photographic image pierces your heart. And there's a kind of a intensity, there's a, there's a kind of a breach of the idea that this is just a representation of, of something external. And for me, it's really interesting. It's not in the images. It's not in the images of this, of this student walking down um, the corridor of his own school. It's, yeah, it's editors. And I'm really interested in that editor. And that's all I want to talk to you about today. I just want to talk to you about the fact that an editorial team of a local newspaper in a small town next to the small town when this, where this happened decided to release this video. This a CCTV footage, very controversial decision, which was widely attacked afterwards. And in making the decision to release this video to the public, to put it on the internet so that the global community would have access to it, that people like us in South Africa would be able to watch it, but so would the parents of those children be able. So would their families, their friends, their grandparents, everyone would be able to see this footage and they made it so they had to make a really difficult decision about should this be seen at all and how should it be seen? and this 
seems to be really interesting because they, there's multiple decisions about representation happening here. Firstly, what footage gets shown? There's, a, there's more than an hour. If you have got nothing better to do with your life, there's more than an hour of CCTV footage relating to this incident, starting from before this young man even enters the school grounds. But they decide to focus on this. They decide to focus on the moment of his entry into the building, he's walking down the corridor, he goes into the classroom. Presumably, there's also CCTV cameras in the classroom. A decision was made not to allow you access to that footage. Okay, so, so very, very clear differentiation there between him walking down the corridor and what takes place in the room that we see him in. But even more than that, it seems to me something really interesting is going on here. So the, the idea of you, that there's a consensus around... Um, there's a consensus around what should be, is and is not an acceptable way of communicating with you about violence. And it's very, very subtle in this because it's not just we don't want to see, we don't want to see what happened in that room, but we also don't want to hear what happened in that room. But it's not even that we don't want to hear what happened in that room. We want to hear part of what happened in that room and not the other part. And this seems an incredibly fine line of distinction. The fact that you hear the gunfire, so, that, so, so the audio is not removed, which would be possibly the standard um, first um, line of engagement. But the sound of children screaming has been removed. And at this point, I can bring 20 years of media theory of critical social analysis, of being a trauma survivor into this and give you an analytic framework. But what I really want to do at this point is I want to do one of two things. I want to walk my dog on the beach. I want to read poetry. My dog's not here, so I'm going to read you a poem. Police in years away, he's from the same region that Pumbla and I are from, Eastern Cape. He says, I cannot think of all the pains. I cannot think of all the pains in men's breasts without the urge to sleep or lie down. I cannot think without seeing God's face in a child's smile or in the lonely cry in the night or in the sea. I cannot think of all the pains that have come and gone, pains in men's waists and in their shoes. I cannot have relief proper wearing a neat. I run around in circles like sprinkling water. I cannot have true relief, swearing out loud and counting out all the pains in my breast and in my... I cannot think of all the pain and all the years wasted. All the craze of lonely men in village rooms and all the bodies that lie out in the cold in avoided streets. I can't run out old like a joyful and watch a pregnant, a sky pregnant with pain or with turbulent rain. I cannot think of, of the soil without lying down. I cannot think of tears, lonely geographies and the third world without the urge to cry or to sit down. And that's really what this talk is about. It's about the urge to cry or sit down. And, and the place of that urge in, in the life of the scholar of violence and trauma. And of how we not only find a language to talk about that, not only how we find a conceptual language to talk about that, but how we find a performative genre to communicate that, to be in that space. How we can simultaneously be academics how we can be social analysts, how we can be social researchers, which are highly formal roles. And one of the things that's built into those roles is notions of objectivity, notions of neutrality, notions of kind of abstract disengagement from our material in a way that does not seem to work when we're working on materials of this kind and problems of snake. So I'm trying to think and to find not just an, a, a theoretical analytic framework, but also a mode of being uh, to talk about. That. At the same time, I want to do some really, really tight theoretical conceptual analysis. So I want to talk about the sound of screaming children being removed in terms of a, of, of a kind of politics of representation that took place. And it, and it would have been a moment in a specific newsroom that I described to you before, small town next to the small town where the killings happened. Journalists are sitting, make, making a decision. And the decision is informed by multiple motives, some of them particularly banal. One of the motives is financial. That's the first and overriding motive, is that they are in the business, they are in the work, they are in the money-earning 
project of journalism. So they want clicks. So they need media on their website that is going to get clicks because if it gets clicks, it gets advertising revenue, okay? So they're, they're trying to make money out of this. That's one of the things guiding this representation. On the other hand, they are also facing certain problems. Um, the nature of the material means that it's volatile, that it can go either way. You know, like, you know, celebrity drama can only really go one way. It just you get the clicks. Um, with, with stuff that is violent and traumatic, it, 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 there, there, there's an intrinsic instability that you can say that people can want to avoid it rather, that, that, that they can get a sense of like, well that, well, that looks interesting. No, 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 I'm not, I'm definitely not gonna go down that path. So there's a sense of like, well, 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 how provocative does it have to be? How confrontational does it have to be? So that it can stay within that realm of the, of the incitement of the click while not crossing over into the realm of the, of the horrific, of the thing that has to be avoided, of the thing like, I don't want that in my news. You know, there's this kind of new age thing, like I don't watch the news anymore. Like, I don't want those bad vibes. And I, I feel, I feel that, you know, I feel people who've make it, made that choice. Um, I think it's the wrong choice, but I, I, I understand the vibe of that choice. And it's an important thing that these journalists sort of been thinking about is like, how far can we push this? How extreme can we make it that it's not too extreme? I mean, can we get in the to Game of Thrones kind of territory or, or where's the where's this thing going to flip over and it becoming uh, a thing that is aversive to people? OK, the other thing we have to understand here is that there's a massive politic preceding this incident. And that's what's really important. So what you've seen is, a, is, is an isolated incident. It is part of a, of a national culture, a national culture, which we're all aware of in the US of school shootings. These are an intrinsic part of the, of the culture of the US. Um, and the reason they are is, it has to do with something very, very specific. It's because the US is the place where most people have the most guns, that, that most of the private firearms in the world are in the hands of private citizens in the US. And, and they're only 4% of the global population. It's totally crazy. And part of it is because there's an intense politics of the right to bear arms, which incidentally, the, that's not, that phrase does not mean the right to own a firearm. It actually, it's been, it's been politically reinscribed as if it means that. Um, and what happened before, tw 20 years before this, does the name Sandy Hook mean anything to most people? You know Sandy Hook. It wasn't 20 years. Sandy Hook was the other big primary school shooting where, where lots of very, very young kids got murdered by, by a school shooter. And what happened after F Sandy Hook is that given the emergent culture of fake news, the, the emergent culture of, kind of, of televisual shock jocks who just make up lies um, in order to kind of incite people into paranoid conspiracy theories in order to get the clicks from doing that. Alex Jones is one of the most egregious bastards of the US <laughs> media world, constructed the Sandy Hook conspiracy theory um, specifically around that, uh, around the idea that Sandy Hook never happened. Okay, this is, apt, is a really, really critical conspiracy theory. So all these, these little children were, were murdered at school, and Alex Jones is like, no, this never happened. And he, he made up the term crisis actors. He said that the people you're seeing in the video, the parents weeping in the street, these are crisis actors. And he, he talks... This gets constructed as a huge part of political discourse because if Sandy Hook really happened, then there's a reason to restrict private gun ownership. So that's what the whole conspiracy theory is about. Um, for Alex Jones, it's also about the clicks, and he made hundreds of millions of dollars out of this conspiracy theory. So, so the important thing with Sandy Hook is, is that it functions politically as a tool of the gun lobby, which is inseparable from the Republican Party, which is inseparable from conservative, conservative economic interests in the U.S., and so it's a, it's, it's a highly functional conspiracy theory that serves a lot of elite groups in a very, very powerful way. The fact that it's just totally fucking crazy isn't really a decisive factor. And this is something we haven't understood about fake news, that it's, that it's craziness, it's absolute delinking from reality is no impediment 
to its circulation and the fact that it, people take it up emotionally and identify with it. So um, anyway, so Sandy Hook happens, uh, the conspiracy theory happens, and these journalists are in this very moment are in the history of the Sandy Hook conspiracy theory. They'll be, they'll be critically aware in that moment that there will be a political mobilization to say that Uvalde never happened. And that part of them as ethical journalists is to lay down evidence to say, yes, look, it happened. So they're trying to give you as much evidence as they can that this is true, okay? But at the same time, they can't overstep the bounds. To really show you it, that it was true, they would, they would show you the footage in the, in the classroom. They would show you the kids rushing to the one side of the room, crouching each other. They would have shown you the... 11 year old girl who wiped her friend's blood over her body and tried to hide under the pile of bodies. They would have shown you that. But that is unreal. <laughs> you cannot show people that. Pe that, is, that, that, that. That exceeds people's tolerance of what they can bear. That you, you've, gone, you've gone deeply into the realm of the, of the unbearable, of the unimaginable of the point at which experience breaks down in trying to contain um, accounts of things. And so there we get this key, we get this key issue, is that we're working at this moment of instability between, uh, around the, the pragmatics of telling the truth, that if we want to tell the truth about things that aren't nice, how do we tell it? How do we code that? How, what visual images, what audio recordings, what explanatory accounts are possible so that we can take people as far into empirical exposure to just how terrible things really are without then introducing the kind of psychodynamic flip, the, the invocation of the defense mechanism where they have to disavow, where they have to be like, no, I cannot, no, no bad vibe. Okay, I don't want that in my news feed. Okay, so we're working. We, we, we and and this is the moment I'm interested in. That that this is a moment that we are working in as scholars in this field all the time. But it's also the moment we're working in as human beings all the time. That we're always working in this moment of like, this is unendurable. This I cannot survive as a human being with this knowledge. I need to not have it. Okay, which is, of course, I mean, in one sense, I imagine it's a very psychodynamic process, uh, the, you know, the process of psychodynamic repression. But it's also, it's also absolutely critically a structural process. It's a process of, of a culture creating forms of expression, norms of journalism um, that, that allow that point to be negotiated. Um, what what does journalistic ethics say is tolerable here? What is it? What are, what our focus groups tell us is the tipping point where people will turn against us rather than clicking our website? And so all of that is happening, and it's happening all the time. And what I want to talk about is the, not not just all of that. I, all I'm doing is describing a scenario leading up to a theoretical question, which I'm now ready to ask. Which, and this is the theoretical question, which of course is only a theoretical question because it's an ethical question, is what work does that do? What work does that, that choice, that problem, that problem of the, the border, the, the, you know, beyond here are monsters, the, the boundary beyond which we cannot go, what work does our practice of maintaining that border do? What does it do in the world? What does it do for us? What does it do to the, um, everyone else around us? Um, now, I'm not going to go over this because Pumla has, has totally written the decisive thing on this in A Human Being Died That Night. The, there's the chapter where she talks about the two women appearing at the Truth Commission and the one is just bursting to tell her the, the story of her terrible suffering and violence and there's the woman who who is angry and retreats to the back of the hall and, 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 and there's a silence and an anger and she doesn't want to talk about it. And, and in that work, Kumla elaborates Judith Herman's kind of dialectic of trauma notion about the, the, the oscillation between trauma being overwhelming and being wanting to come out, wanting to tell its story and trauma always being kind of repressed and silenced and, and how we, we're always in that space. So 
Go back and read that again if you haven't read it already. It's it's fantastic. So I don't want to, to repeat that, and there isn't space and time for me to do that. But I want to talk about this this moment of uh, where where essentially something is so terrible that we can only fall into two responses to it. The response of being of it just being too intense. That moment, the moment that I opened this talk with, the moment where sometimes I just want to cry. Or the moment where Olisi um, Mies, or I just, you know, he talks about, um, he just wants to lie down. Um, and that, so the moment of being crippled by chaotic intensity such that you cannot function, or the defense against that, which is to dissociate and simply not be able to engage a thing at all because it has to be not part of your experiential and conceptual world. Like, like how, do we, how do we work? with that moment? How do we work with that, with the problem of the breakdown of the capacity to represent experience? And, and, and it's a problem in the, dom- in the domain of violence and trauma. That's where it happens, that, that we are working with this, this, with this point of breaking down of the capacity to represent experience. And as, as, as Herman points out in her um, seminal classic, Trauma and Recovery, one of the things about trauma, well, f- well, the first thing she points out is the is, is the unspeakability and the silencing that is invoked by trauma. But she also identifies something else that is so fundamentally important is that one of the traumatic experiences of trauma is not just the helplessness and terror that she describes so articulately, but the way in which it breaks down the bonds between people, that the notion of the, the moment of that terrible experience, one of the most terrible things about it is that you can only ever have that experience on your own, is that there's something about that experience that cannot, you can't tell someone about it. Um, I have this experience working in Australia on a daily basis. I start telling them a South African anecdote and I see the horror on their faces. And I'm like, yeah, I'd better stop telling the story now because these, these people are, don't know about this stuff in the world. They live in a different kind of universe where bad stuff like that doesn't happen. You know, wanting to tell them uh, Fort Hare Vice Chancellor attempted assassination and they, they killed his bodyguard instead of him. And I start the story with them. Um, yeah, and so, and, and his bodyguard, and they're like, they can't even get to that. They can't even like, what do you mean? The vice chancellor of a university has a bodyguard? Like that's how far they are from, from imagining it. Point being that it's in exactly this moment where you cannot have, you, you, can't, you can't go down that road. The thing is too much for anyone else. It's so, it's unbearable for you, but you had, but it happened anyway. It's unbearable to other people. So you cannot actually explain it to them. Because you cannot uh, uh, explain it to them, there's the shared understanding of experience is broken. There's a fundamental break, a fundamental alienation that happens in the unshareability and the unrepresentability of the experience. And of course, the link to that is the problem of kind of secondary or vicarious trauma that I stopped telling my, my colleagues overseas these stories because I'm, I realize I'm harming them. It's actually violent for me to tell them those things. It's, it does damage to them. And so I stop. And this idea that what we're doing in this field is not only are we exposing ourselves to the violent effects of, of, some, of the knowledge of the, of the things in our field, but, but we're always at risk of harming others by, by wanting to, to, to include them in that and, and, and make them insiders to that, that really brutalizing knowledge. So all of these are, are, are really the, 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 the fundamental problems of being a scholar in this field. And, and I want to talk about it in, in relation to this kind of distant um, <laughs> problem and, and the problem of, of representation. Now, one of the things before I showed you that video, I said, look, I'm not going to show you the images of violence, but you're going to imagine the violence. And surely you did imagine violence and surely it was shocking for you. But what's interesting is the politics around, around trigger warnings, around that what, those of us who work in the trauma field, we, we put content descriptors on things because we know that, that knowing or imagining things harms people. Uh, but of course, you've got a mobilization. You've got this kind of resurrection of a certain kind of, of authoritarian, masculine, political conservatism symbolized in the, in the, in, in the figure of, of Jordan Peterson and, and this idea of 
you know, that we've all gone soft now. We all are, you know, it's just, we're, we're, we're all snowflakes, all crybabies, we all got spoiled by our parents. We, and, 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 you know, that the, we, we all need to toughen up. We all need to harden up a bit. And, 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 and so the, the attempt to, to reinsert a kind of a, uh, notions of masculinity, notions of a kind of dissociated, unaffected, invulnerable subject, um, especially in academia. And one of the things that's interesting about it is this is a burden, I, I describe it in terms of masculinity, that is placed specifically on female scholars, because the female scholars have to be more masculine than masculine scholars, otherwise they're going to be feminine, otherwise they're going to be like swooning and fainting and weeping in their offices and and, and confirming every reason why a scholarship should be a masculine domain and, 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 and shouldn't be non-gendered. So, so this is all happening in terms of, of a kind of a, a politics of, of, of invulnerability. And, and, and once again, the thing that I'm so excited about in the, in, on the internet is people are asserting their right to be vulnerable. Young people are creating a discursive field of articulate vulnerability in a way which is kind of amazing, which is kind of transcended where psychologists and trauma theorists are, are working. The, the kind of popular culture has just, has just run ahead of the scholarship in the field. And, and, but, it, but it's a fight, and it's a, particularly in the US, which is why this example is interesting to me, it's a culture war. There's a, there's, a, there's a fight between the right of vulnerable people to, to present their vulnerability um, versus the, the kind of invocation of, the, of, of, of these kind of regressive masculinities. Um, and, and one of the, the, the key sort of ways in which it's fought over, and this is particularly in the, in the American domain, is around the notion of, of freedom, the freedom to, to, to say what I want to say, um, which means two completely different things. The one is the freedom to be a human being, to express my, my, my feelings, uh, uh, to describe what my history, to, dis to, to, to have people to communicate with people about who I am and what I'm going through, that freedom. But, the, but it's also then conscripted into another kind of freedom, which is the freedom of bullies, the freedom of machismo, the freedom of thuggery, the freedom of repression, the freedom of silencing vulnerable people. And that's seen as, and, and so that's the Jordan Peterson freedom. It's like, like I'm not going to use your pronouns. I'm not going to let you use uh, trigger warnings. Because I just, I just have this intrinsic historical right to fuck you over. And so that's a really, really important articulation of freedom. And, and of course, it, it happens in different contexts. And even in South Africa, people sometimes invoke culture as a way of exercising that kind of freedom, repressive freedom, the freedom to continue using uh, vulnerable people. Um, so this is really central uh, uh, because when, when we start talking in that way, it starts being clear that these are not just psychological processes. These have to do with, with, with systemic forms of political organization and culture. So, so, so what, what, we, what we're trying to grasp here is this idea of, of, of the right to speak, the, the ability to speak versus the risk of being silenced as being fundamental in terms of, a, of the kind of politics of being human uh, but also fundamental in terms of the experience of trauma. Right? And one of, the, one of the, the important things that really comes out of survivor work and, and, and victim work um, is the importance of the articulation of the victim story, the importance of the acceptance, the recognition, the creation of, 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 of support communities, of people collectively being able to say, me too. Just an incredibly, incre like, for two words to have conveyed that much power, just the simple words, me too. Someone first said me before anyone else said me too. That saying of me, this happened to me, this is real, this was my experience. It was, everyone denied it, everyone lied about it, everyone turned away, but this is me. And then other people were able to say me too. And suddenly an entire cultural formation emerged that made it possible for a, a, a transformative empowerment social process for survivors. Okay. And, and, and to understand that, that it's both, it's, it's both the struggle of the traumatized person to, 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 to find voice, but it's also the, it's, it's also the, the shifting of the boundary of representability such that everyone can now say it. 
it's so so that versus five years ago, there's a kind of experience of sexual violence and sexual harassment, which which you can just talk about now. You can just say out loud that happened um, in a way that people, your parents' generation, it was unimaginable to say that. No good could come of making that claim. Okay? And this is exactly what we're doing. And so one of the things that I see us doing as scholars of violence and trauma is extending the boundaries of, of narratability, okay? We are shifting what can be said. We're shifting the domain. You know, there's this famous Freudian quote. He says, where id is, their ego shall be. It is a work of culture like the, the, the construction, uh, I forget what the word, the, the pushing back of the data Z. I mean, essentially means the creation of the dikes that hold back the sea in the creation of Holland, okay? But, but it's, it, it's about th these things that are hidden, these things that are oppressed, these, these can be claimed into our collective space, they can be brought into these rooms if we all acknowledge, um, we all acknowledge them. Um, but in doing that, and this is really my, my, the, my final points that I'm making for today, is as we do that, we realize that there are multiple and competing kind of interests and conflicts going on. Um, and when those journalists were making the decision to say, yes, we want to show the footage of him walking down the school corridor, but we will not show the footage of the classroom. We're going to show the sounds of the gunfire. We're going to record the sounds of the gunfire, but we're not going to record the sounds of the screaming children. Okay. They were imagining audiences. They were imagining these different people. And I already described some of them. What does this mean as me as a kind of voyeur in South Africa, you know, concerned about gun violence, school killings? Um, what does it mean for the friends of those children? You know, one of the worst things about the Sandy Hook story um, is um, one of the kids who, who's, who's, who, 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 who was there when all his friends were, ki were killed in the room he watched he watched all these school kids all these school friends getting killed and his parents were fox news watchers and they watched alex jones and they believed alex jones and so they started telling their traumatized son that he was lying about what happened at school that day when all these kids when friends were murdered and i think about that a lot I think about that moment a lot because that's a, that that moment captures for me this problematic of audiences that moment captures this question of like Who's doing what, when, what story is being told? Okay. Um, so, so who is this good for? This is my question. Who, who is an account good for? Okay. So when you say, um, okay, the, showing the guy walking in the school, showing the sound of the gunfire, that's good because that helps. That is going to help people acknowledge that this really happened. Okay, it's going to stop the next Alex Jones conspiracy theory. It's going to stop the next Sandy Hook conspiracy theory. But it's also going to do something else. So some of those kids, um, their, their friends, their, their families are going to click on this link and they're going to see it. And it's going to be an incredibly violating experience. It's going to be a violent, traumatic. And that's happening simultaneously. And so this decision is being balanced there. But part of what I want to do in my work is to push this um, um, and to try and work out how we balance our concern with the immediacy and intimacy of, the, of, 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 of immediate victims and violence. And to say, well, what, 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 what work do these, these representations do? Because which ones do the best work? Which ones actually help us address the problem, which is why we do this work of how we can reduce violence in the future. Okay. And there's a fundamental inconsistency. There's a problem I can't solve here because there's a small community of children who were murdered. There's a slightly large community of their families. There's a slightly large community of the people who live in that town. But there's a very much bigger community of every other child going to school in the US and every parent and every friend of every one of those children. That's a much, much, much bigger community. That's a community that's been running into the hundreds of millions. And we also have to act in the best interests of that community. And it seems to me that what I can't solve is that the interests of the immediate community, say the grandmother of one of those, the, those deceased children, and the community of, of every parent in the U.S. sending their children to school every single day, 
actually have conflicting representative representational needs. Because what those parents, what every other parent needs is for the school shootings to stop. And for the school shootings to stop, what we need is, a, is, a, is an absolute visceral, inescapable confrontation with just how bad this really is. There's a kind of, and part of me, part of me has this double feel. Part of me wants to rub people's faces in this stuff. Like every day, part of me was, wants to just get up and say, you, you need to know about it. It is not okay to lead your life in denial, in ignorance. And being a white person growing up in apartheid, this is a really, really, really intense part of that experience. It's part of like wanting to say to people, stop lying about what's going on. Okay, and part of me still lives with that and has that impulse and is driven by the impulse to like, to say, no, you, you have to, whether you like it or not, you have to know this because you are, you are harming people by pretending you don't know. On the other hand, part of me as a, as a trauma studies scholars, scholar is like, vicarious traumatization is a very real and very terrible thing that we do to ourselves and each other every single day. And we need to be mindful of it. We need to not be Jordan Peterson. We need not to be the guy who says, like, five trigger war. We need to be the person who's like, understands that even the little things we do, even, even the sharing of information is act, can, can it, it, it is potentially triggering, is potentially harmful, is potentially destructive. Not only that, not only is the ethics of that, but there's also this problem of the instability that, that, that even if you feel it's right to do it, even if you feel it's important to share that, there's this, there's this moment in which the dissociation with the defense, the ideological kind of closing down of the narratability kicks in. And, and, and so you trigger the unknowability by pushing it too far. You make people retreat into, into complete denialism. Like by, um, and, 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 and so it becomes a tactical thing of how far you can go. Like how far can you say, look, we need to know about this, but I need to present it to you in a way that's not just going to make you kind of shut down cognitively, effectively, emotionally, so that in fact, so that, the, that, so that no actual human communication is possible in this context anymore. Um, and, and, and this is why I use in the title of the talk the, the notion of conundrums is because, because I'm stuck there, because I'm really, really stuck with the pragmatics of the fact that there isn't a rule, that there isn't a simple like, oh, yes, when we analyze all the steps, we arrive at conclusion X. Instead, what I'm left with is that we are living on this tightrope all the time. We're, we're balancing and we're always tipping to one side and then overcorrecting to the other side and then tipping back. And so that the work of being a, a violence and trauma scholar is really the work of, of this tightrope walk. And it's not just a tightrope walk. A tightrope walk is always in danger. They're always in danger of falling and that's the fascination of them. Um, but the problem is that, that as we walk on this tightrope, we are walking in communities and we are always, we are always carrying with us the risk of either harming people through one kind of representation or harming people through a failure to represent violence and trauma. And that's the kind of space that I'm, that I'm wanting us to just sit with and try and think about. Thank you very much, really. I would like to start with the, the question of conundrums that we are leaving us with to, to, to think about whether actually we should be be uh, immobilized by the conundrums. In one of your closing statements, you speak about the challenge of expanding the boundaries of narratability. And in a way, that's what you did with that poem. And what it evolved in me was were two, were two images, one from the Truth Commission and one from my drive to work most mornings. And the Truth Commission one has to do with the idea that you've got these stories of violence that people are bringing to the public of South Africa as part of our, you know, transition and, you know, process of healing. And you have moments when a lot of this pain 
is not fully exposed. So there's a sense in which that is arrested. The telling of the stories becomes arrested. And even in the context of that, you know, there is also the disavowal that you talk about by the public that, you know, this is an exaggeration, this is a, you know, cry commission. So there's a silencing of so much else that has to do with our past that makes me wonder whether actually you are right, or at least your question is important, that isn't part of the problem, even with that moment of transition for us, that there wasn't a full confrontation with actually the question of what happened. What is it that you're dealing with in this history? And so, so the question then of how do we understand what happened as in the violence, the big V, and in, in, in the more conceptualizing, you know, the kind of, you know, deconstructing what it means in the second part and the thirdly, what do you do about it, you know, as a, in terms of the moving forward kind of thing. That's the, the first image. The second image is very brief. It's a little boy who's standing in gray pants and, and a white shirt. He's about eight years old. He's going to school. He's surrounded by, by trash, by trash and by buckets of the, what do you call these toilets, these portable toilets. He's standing there, clearly waiting for lift to school. And there is blue plastic bags all around him. And these buckets, you know, that are waiting to be collected. I mean, that is violence. And we pass there. And, and so there are just these two moments. This boy wasn't born during apartheid. He's growing up now. What do we do with that? You know, it's violence, a different kind. What do you do? How do you speak about that? How do you actually bring it into the space of unraveling the contemporary moment of violence as opposed to that one of the TRC and how to think about why these moments, you know, are so important for us as scholars of violence and trauma? I mean, those are the big questions, right? So, so yeah. So, I mean, I'm opening that to you. I know that you, you, you are thinking about this. I'm, you know, it's a provocation that mm. I'm throwing mm. back at you, yeah. if you may. Yeah. Um, but it's something that also, you know, invites us all to reflect yeah. on. And and and, it, and and these incidents that uh, these, these 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 scenes that you you talk about this this moment of the young boy in the in in, in the situation of clear structural violence and the and the and the I'm reluctant I, I'm I'm not terribly enthusiastic about being part of the discourse of the failure of the of the TRC um, I'm yeah, part of the, yeah. I'm I'm happy to be critical of the TRC but there's a, there's a kind of a I think for younger people, it's just like, well, yeah, TRC is fucking bullshit. Um, because it didn't do a particular thing. It, because the TRC didn't bring about social justice. But what it did, and, and you have to be our age to understand this, it really pushed back against certain kinds of lies. Like certain just blatant, brazen lies, misinformation, denial, erasure. And it really did that. And I think... I think people now don't imagine how important how important the TRC was as a as a as a pushback against gaslighting against the gaslighting of the political system. It it couldn't bring about economic justice. It wasn't its mandate, but it could. People who were responsible for violence lying about their violence, and in that sense, it's exactly the same as the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement didn't really send a lot of people to jail other than Harvey Weinstein, but it stopped a lot of people lying about their practices being normal and their victims not really having suffered. And that is a very, very important work on its own. It's not the Me Too movement didn't bring about the end of patriarchy. The TRC didn't bring about economic justice in South Africa. That's fine. We're still going to do that work. But Anthony, it did an important thing. Yes, a couple of hands. Hi, I'm Mahita. Um, I have a background in media communication studies. So my question kind of comes from that paradigm. And I think it's, it's really interesting how much of the questions that you're asking are actually translated through screens and different like media yeah. 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 mediation right your last 
And a question for reflection was what what kinds of represent, representations can, mm. and I think that forces us to think about, well, can representations do anything? Can, you know, can media representations, can texts actually cause behaviors? And, you know, there's a whole strand within kind of media studies where all these experiments were done, like, you know, do does playing video games make people violent? Does watching pornography make people sexist, etc.? And largely, you know, lack of evidence to prove causative, causal effect. So I'm not saying that media don't have an influence. Of course, they do. They're one of many multiple complex social factors that will cause someone to be violent, right? But I don't think just the representations on their own, one way or another, are going to decrease gun violence, <laughs> right. I, I feel like the question, like that question needs to be like paused with a bit as well. I'm thinking like what the relationship is between media representation and social behavior. Yeah. And, and which is not to say that the questions about the forms of representation that you raise. Are not <laughs> yeah, look, two things. Sorry, I didn't realize that I shouldn't swear in this. Talk, <laughs> um, I swear a lot um, uh, because, because I deal with stuff that is swear worthy claim it's about swear worthy yeah. <laughs> it's new yeah. no, I, I really stand by that because sometimes my students say could you could you please say this in class and i'm like no actually i think it's really appropriate given our subject matter that i use <laughs> very very strong uh, anyway I, I, i'm also a little bit out of media studies that that whole thing of like, oh, does this representation cause that in this like lab finished? I mean, that's preposterous nonsense. Only a positivist could imagine such a ludicrous research project as to even ask that question in that form. So I'm just going to push that aside. The real put, I mean, it's not like, oh, I, I see this image, boom, and then I act in this way. Like I see this and I'm going to go punch one in the face. That, that's not the point. The point is that the media, the, that it's a system that produces an ideology that interpolates subjects and then live in a social world. It's that kind of mechanism. That's why we've got critical media studies, not this positivist representation nonsense questions. Okay. So, for instance, me, if I had not been exposed to certain representations, I wouldn't be able to do the work. The, the violence problem problem solving work. If I hadn't read Pumla's book, Judith Herman's book, if I hadn't read Gramsci, if I hadn't read Marx. I mean, these are representations. Marx is a representation of the violence of capitalism. If I hadn't done that, I wouldn't I wouldn't be in the world solving certain problems. So that's a much more interesting way of looking at it to me. And 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 that's why what I'm really interested in is, is, is talking to all the young scholars now who are who are going into the world in a certain way with certain framings of that world. And the framings of that world are, those framings are framings via discourse, via, via representation, via ideas, via images. So it's not just the photo, it's not just the video game, like, wow, 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 wow. It's, it's, it's the meaning system that is produced. And by producing a meaning system, you create an experienced lived world for the person who then lives in that world, who does certain things in that world, which they wouldn't otherwise do. And I, I feel a bit strongly about that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. We feel that, we feel you as well. Yeah. Anthony, thank you for um, the presentation. I remember seeing this clip pop up on my, my Twitter mm. and it, Equally, it was that editor's note, and then I just like closed the tab, and I was like, "This is this is, this is too much." But my question is around um, again. Also, I'm still I'm still lingering on the representation thing. I was more convinced with the scene you spoke about at the end when you described the young boy who was at Sandy Hook and his parents telling him that this didn't happen. Because I was like, that is the gaslighting that you started the conversation with. And so for me, I'm just like, is it really a question of like representation? Because I understand it like as scholars, that's where we can we can do the theoretical work. We can do the social work. But I think part of the frustration and even it, it comes out in this language, you know, because it's an expression of rage, outrage at these kinds of things, is that we know who the audience is. We know who these parents are and what they're doing to their children. And so I was more relieved towards the end here. I was just like, holy, I'm like, can you say something now? <laughs> um, at the refrain, lies, lies, lies. Mm -hmm. And I think part of what's been pushing this, uh, this gaslighting moment as like a cultural mm -hmm. vernacular that people are, are able to use is that 
there's a generation that is actually calling out lies about what has happened um, and naming it as that and saying, we know that this is white supremacy. We know that this is colonization and we just need you to stop pretending like it's not. And that there are consequences behind it because that little boy is many people uh, who are running our institutions today in South Africa, who are running corporations everywhere. So I think there is something powerful about naming and describing it as lies that also starts knocking at the integrity that the false integrity that these institutions and these systems of violence. And, and it's precisely a war of representation yeah. that there are two arm, rep, representational armies trying to give an account of the world and the one is and so you as a young person saying that is gaslighting that is colonial gaslighting that is white supremacist gaslighting you're engaging in a war of representation against a, a consolidation of power maintaining a certain social structure and that's why for me representation is like the beginning of politics and ethics and that's why i'm interested in i mean i, I literally teach a, a third year course called representing violence and it's this is all it's about. It's very important, this kind of grappling. As we move into a project, potentially a collaborative project within this institution, where we're going to look at an exhibition at the moment in the museum that is representing the history of this institution as the highlights of the last hundred years. Okay, so the, the violence in that representation. And we're going to be part of, hopefully, an inclusive process to say, how can we represent this differently? to actually face up to the violence of this history and our responsibility in terms of restitution of the future. And this is just, we're on the verge of embarking on this. And I think all these difficult questions about how do we do this in a way that actually uh, becomes transformative, I think it's just been very uh, challenging and also like uh, humbly, like it's, this, is, this is going to be very difficult to do this in a way that does not feed into branding and uh, PR management of restitution statements. So um, this is now, yeah, I think we're in the midst of a very practical application of some of those. Yeah. And, 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 and for me, some of them, one, like as you're getting to the end of your thing and wrapping it up and you talk about and, and then branding mm -hmm. and PR media, so that's, that's actually the, the risk at the moment. Because I mean, now that we, we're, in, we're in the kind of decolonial era where where it's not only what not the obvious war of you calling out some colonial mythology that is being encoded in the museum it's the management of the university saying oh that's actually a really good pr thing yeah. we can we can we can now rebrand ourselves as the post africana decolonial space where people talk openly about violence and trauma and we'll get more students and more funding and international scholars will come and visit us that's that is the new that is the new political exploitation it's not it's not just the decolonial debate it's like the the, the really the really astute beam counters are looking down on that and saying oh, we can make money out of both sides of that story so we need to think about that too and that might be in our yeah. interest it might so, be in our interest absolutely. to play up to them and say okay we'll help you, you brand you know i mean i was just but uh, but you see sometimes like being cynical and think okay well you can you can can use that branding because once you've used it we've got leverage against you because we can hold you to account for what we pretended to you be. See, that's why uh, you see exactly. I mean, I think that's absolutely. I think this is very, very important because we, we had recently, a con just this week, a conversation about precisely this issue that there is a sense in which there's an embrace of these kinds of debates, you know, and in fact, embrace in the support of this embrace on the one hand. Mm -hmm. And then there are all these contradictory other mm -hmm. movements, yeah. you know, so how, and, and your point about how do you hold people who say, yay, do this because we benefit from it. How do you hold them to account so that, you know, you, and, and how you do that, I think we have to answer that question, actually, which is what I was hoping you do. Mm -hmm. We have to answer this question, say, yes, this is what we do. We, we do not hold back. The conversation doesn't end at, at the critique, but the conversation actually goes beyond the critique to acting mm -hmm. so that having said that the space is open you do this then rather than say actually you are lying you you mm. are contradicting yourself yeah. we rather say okay we we see all of this as a strategy we also play you know you know ignorance of mm. the dynamics mm. 
and instead we act because the space is open for us to act. So we, we yeah. said we must, then we are doing. And, and I think that really is is a really sort yeah. of an and, answer. And, and, and one thing I want to really put on the table is it, it was so important. I really think about the words I use sometimes. Sometimes I just say skin shit, but sometimes I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, the word conundrum in the title of this talk is absolutely, absolutely conceptually central because it refers to the fact that as academics, we try and solve things. We try and say, oh, okay, now that I've looked at all the factors, all the analysis, all the evidence, I can see that is the wrong yeah. position, this is the right position. And one of the things that I'm trying to do is say, sometimes there yeah. isn't a right and yeah. wrong. Sometimes it is a tight rope. It's a, it's, both sides are contradictory. So sometimes saying to the administration, yes, we'll talk, use our decolonial language, it's a conundrum because they're going to use it to lie, and but you're maybe right. going to use it to expose their life. It's going to be both at the same time, that you're not going to get off the tightrope. So what I want to, if, if, if I want to do anything in this talk, it's forget everything else I said and say, start thinking not in terms of being morally right or wrong. Start thinking about conundrums, start thinking about contradictions, whether the, the opposite effects of the same thing can be true at the same time and you in the live process of balancing them and understanding them with every new step you take that's really what i want wow to give that's you really today. great how, how do you hold the ambivalence actually I, I i really think this is so important what we are ending this because often we get caught up in spending our energy in the critiquing you know rather than in thinking, okay, yes, of course, there is what has to be critiqued, but there's also the action of what it is that we do do. So I think this idea of the ambiguity of all of these things, as South Africans, that's where we are. I mean, our, our lives, our you know, post-apartheid situation is about ambiguities. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For more, you can check out our website.